So it's very important to be able to provide opportunities for education, and in particular, higher education for refugees. Um, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that you end up with a situation where an entire generation of young people hasn't had access to formal education. That means that they haven't been exposed to more of the world, they haven't been able to get out and kind of think broadly. It also means that they're really poorly prepared for future careers, right? You end up with a whole group of people who have very limited abilities to integrate into societies where they live, engage in rebuilding if they get to go home again, or kind of become productive for themselves and for their family members. Um, so it creates huge inequality issues going forward. Um, the other reason that our program is particularly important is because we're not just providing a pathway to higher education, but we're providing a pathway to community work, right? To being able to design and implement participatory projects that bring together people in the communities. So not only will the students who go through our program come out with much greater access to formal traditional learning and the credentials that goes with that, they're also gonna come out with the skills to build the institutions that will help their communities right now during crisis and will be able to rebuild when they go home. It really has to be a multi-stakeholder effort to make sure that refugees have access to education. For some people who are refugees, all they really need is a scholarship. Right? And that can be provided by individual universities, either in the country of first reception or in other third party receiving countries, right? like Canada, like uh, other wealthy states. Um, and so for some students, that's great. But other students are going to need more support, either because of personal trauma they've undergone or because they come from disenfranchised places in their home country. And so we'll need more support to be able to access higher education. One of the biggest things we are seeing for students coming into our program is that they've, uh, they will have come through a very hierarchical educational environment where there are always right answers, it's very competitive. In the Arab world, your results on your end of year exams are published with numbers in the paper, right? There's this real hierarchy of what you do. And we're aiming to build an environment of collaboration and cooperation, right? And that's a new way of learning and a new way of practicing education for our students. So we need to help them make that transition. So I think the best programs are those that take advantage of what's existing on the ground. So our project is working with the American University in Beirut, which is one of the best universities in the Arab world, um, to take advantage of what they know on the ground and also to work with non-academic partners who understand the conditions for refugees. So some of the most successful programs about this work with the UN, work with NGOs, um, and we're following that model as well because you need to be able to get a whole picture of where your students are to be able to meet them there and bring them to where you want them to go. Education is essential to rebuilding because you can very easily end up with a system where the only people who've had access to education after a conflict are the children of the people who've been waging that conflict um, and the children of elites who were able to be sent to be educated abroad during the war. Um, and that produces a situation where you end up with a very limited elite who's capable of taking on leadership after a transition. Um, and frequently this leads to perverse consequences down the road. And so broadening access to education for a whole wide range of refugees and conflict afflicted populations really makes a difference because it means you can pull from a bigger range of people. And we also think we're making a particular contribution to peace building in the region because we're educating people in community mobilization and community organizing, which means basic participatory everyday democratic practices through which people make up their minds about what they should do, work collaboratively, and, and design things that are in their own best interest. And particularly in a context where governments have always pitted people against each other, which is true in a huge part of the world, but particularly in the contemporary Middle East, and working in a context where people's experience of working with others has been informing on each other or having to hide any cooperation from each other or being kind of every person for themselves, getting a group of diverse students together, putting them in a classroom and showing them what can happen 
if you work together and if you follow these participatory processes, creates the seeds for a new generation of leaders who will have new experiences, new capabilities, and will be able to run programs that will help the society rebuild in more democratic and effective ways. So there's the obvious huge logistic obstacle, right, which is being able to coordinate delivery of services, being able to admit students and handle all of this. And so that's one huge set of challenges. But those aren't the really significant challenges. Those are the ones we're capable of handling quite easily. The bigger challenges are the challenges that make education for refugees so difficult in the first place. On the one hand, you have to deal with interrupted educations, missing documents, and missing time, right? So the educational system in Lebanon is in French and English. The educational system in Syria is in Arabic. So when students arrived at high school age, they weren't able to just drop into the nearest school because they didn't speak the language of instruction barely at all, right? So this is a major issue that we're going to be dealing with, is getting students English up to snuff. Some people left in the dead of night, their houses were blown up, other people knew and had time to leave but didn't pack well, so people don't have their secondary school leaving certificates, right? So they can't present their documents to be verified the way that we might here in Canada or the way that the Lebanese university system expects them to do, right? They're supposed to show up with their, uh, with their tawhiji to be able to show and get it stamped, right? Um, and so if you don't have your papers, what then? Right? This becomes a major issue for people. Um, I've even heard stories of refugees sneaking back into Syria to try to get their papers so they can enroll in university, and some of them don't make it back. Right, So we really want to make sure that those barriers are eliminated. And then the last barrier is the exigencies of everyday living in refugee conditions. Um, once a person gets to be 15, 16, 17, 18, right, even if their parents say we would love for you to go to school, but we are poor, we don't have resources, we left any capital we had back home, if we were agricultural producers back home, we left our land, in their late teens and the university age students were targeting, at that point, young women are told to get married and young men are told to go to work. Right? Because their parents say, you need to be contributing to the household, and we're worried for you. We're scared for you. Sending out your kids to school can be seen as you know, wasting time for them. And so there's a lot of encouragement for you know, marriage of teenage girls to teenage boys, usually, um, because it provides a little more protection for them in the eyes of their parents, and for young men to go find work, which is often difficult labor, poorly paid, and not protected because they're working under the table. Um, and so you get this situation where people are sent out to work and don't continue their educations even to the point of high school graduation, let alone university. So we're trying to address some of these issues. We're trying to make sure that students have living stipends while they're pursuing our courses so that they'll be able to make up that opportunity cost. We're making sure that we're providing English instruction in advance so that students can really feel ready to tackle English language course material and having as many bilingual staff as possible so that they can get support in Arabic when they need to. Um, and to really make sure that we address the issues the students are facing as directly as we can to make sure that they can not only get into our program, but that they can graduate and they can succeed afterwards. So I'm the co-director of the Community Mobilization in Crisis Project, which is the University of Ottawa's attempt to make a meaningful intervention into the lack of higher education for refugees. Um, and so what I'm doing, along with my co-director and uh, a really enthusiastic group of volunteers is to uh, design and implement a program for Syrian refugees, also Palestinian and Iraqi refugees, and members of the Lebanese host community in Beirut, Lebanon. And so our project is focused around not only providing access to higher education, but then providing skills training, particularly in the field of community mobilization, to make sure that students can get out in the world and make a meaningful difference in their communities. So the program we're doing is in Lebanon, where formally there are no refugee camps, because you aren't allowed to call anywhere refugees live a camp. So Lebanon has a mixture of urban refugees, who are people who rent apartments and live in working class neighborhoods all over the city uh, and the country, or they're so that's urban refugees. Or there are a lot of people who live in, the euphemism is, informal tented settlements, which is for some reason not a refugee camp, despite the fact that it looks exactly like one. Um, and in these informal tented settlements,
Settlements generally exist in rural and agricultural areas, more access to day labor for workers um, and some access to things like that. Those folks are much further from resources. What we're hoping to do in our program is to bring together a mixture of urban and settlement-based refugees, um, particularly those who are able to kind of move around a bit within their context, but are able to work in places where there's already some infrastructure on the ground. The nice thing about working in Lebanon is it's pretty much two hours from any point in the country to Beirut, because Beirut's central and the country's about the same size as the Montreal metropolitan region. So there's lots of ability for us to say, have students have class in Beirut twice a week, but then spend their other three days a week at home in their community in the Daqa, in the south, up near Tripoli, um, in order to do, do their internship work and their other coursework on their own embedded where they live. So there are a lot of things that you, as an ordinary person, can do to help support refugee education. Um, first of all, if you live someplace where refugees are being resettled, figure out what opportunities are available for volunteering locally. Um, very much any approach to refugee issues is going to require multi-location engagement, right? Which means that if you're in a North American or European city where people are being resettled, figure out what the resettlement organizations in your town are doing. I know they need folks to go volunteer in youth programs. I know they need people to do college counseling. I know they need people to do English teaching, right? So all of these opportunities are available to you. If you'd like to participate in something at more of a distance, so for instance, uh, there's an NGO, Jusur, by a bunch of uh, Syrian expatriates that's helping connect uh, mentors to Syrian refugee students who are looking to go to undergraduate and graduate school in other countries, right? So if you wanted to act as a mentor to someone, that's an opportunity available to you. But then specifically our project, we need resources and we need support from people in terms of attention, sharing our issues, and of course donations, right? Running a program like the one we're running is going to involve a huge commitment of staff, of time, and of funds to direct towards our students. So we would love volunteers, particularly for people located either in Beirut, elsewhere in Lebanon, or folks located here in Canada. And we would also welcome donations uh, because this is a big project with a big price tag to do it right. I think what's really important is to realize that refugee crises don't start mattering when they show up on our doorstep. I am shocked and saddened every time I hear people talking about the refugee crisis as if it started in September 2015 when there have been refugees and migrants fleeing desperate situations drowning on the Mediterranean for decades and when the civil war in Syria has been going on since uh, 2011, right? So that these desperate flows of people are nothing new. And I think we need to realize that those of us in the West who are just now getting wise to this issue, we're behind the curve, right? And we have a lot of catching up to do in order to meaningfully and justly address the situation of refugees. So I think it's important that we figure out where we can intervene locally, globally, to support refugee pro refugees, to support the initiatives coming out of conflict-affected communities, and to make sure that everybody has access to education, that everyone has access to health care and food and shelter and the support and empowerment they need to lead dignified lives.